Hello, fiendlings. How the hell are you? I know I've been quiet for a while, but it's been with good reason. I both started and finished a novel during the past two months, and I'm currently in the process of putting it to bed. The book in question is called An Ancient Trap, and see the link in the show notes to get more information about it, as well as sample the prologue, which I need to re-record. Like my short stories Whispers, Human Compatible, and Jury Rigged, as well as the novel Station 3, An Ancient Trap is another suit's tale. The novel is quote-unquote finished, although I'm still in the process of recording it for my Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, Ko-Fi subscribers. Hint, hint. They're currently up to chapter 16, and I'm in the process of editing chapter 17. The audio, I mean. I'm getting great feedback, and I think this is one you'll enjoy. Regardless, I wanted to touch base and give y'all a little something to get you in the mood for the eventual podcast run of An Ancient Trap. At least I think it will be eventual. We'll see. Now, a little about this tale. Like the other Suits stories, this one was written for an anthology. In this case, on Deadly Ground, back in 2021, which, by the way, is available as an ebook and audiobook. The anthology was themed around Last Stands. Since I was writing Derelict Trident at the time, I had sentient entities on the brain and realized I could make an AI the sole focus of the story for once. I want to write another tale like this. I hope you like it. That's all for now. You'll get another episode next week. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again soon. Here's part one of Human Compatible. Human Compatible by Paul E. Cooley The pirate's ambush had been far better prepared than Mixon had forecasted. Instead of attacking with multiple gunships, the pirates had chosen to spread missile batteries and fixed gun mounts across the belt. When Mixon's ship had entered the area, the pirates sprang their trap by activating the weapons in multiple series from different trajectories, each firing a fusillade of what at first was most likely decoy munitions. Each time the ship's gunners wiped out a wave of missiles, another series activated. Flack had chewed through most of the first five waves, but while the overheating guns reloaded and fresh missiles slid into their tubes, the real munitions arrived. Instead of consisting of the usual mishmash of stolen weapons, homemade warheads, and the occasional low-yield nuke, these had been military-grade. The likelihood of even well-equipped pirates having the skill to not only lead them into the belt using stolen or cloned freighter class IDs, but place their munitions in such a manner? Based on the energy readings her remaining sensors detected, there was a 97.23% probability the pirates had other batteries lying in wait up ahead. The ship's maneuvering engines had already suffered irreparable damage. Without them, the ship couldn't decelerate. Even if it could have, Mixon had already run thousands of simulations to determine if they would have made a difference. Those routines had returned the mathematical equivalent of no. In many ways, her crew had already given up. She didn't blame them. Between the remaining exterior cameras and her other inner ship sensor arrays, Mixon knew the question of survival was moot. The damage to the ship was catastrophic, and assistance was days, if not weeks, away. She had already communicated those facts to the captain. His response had been characteristically human. Grim silence. Still, humans had to have their rituals. They had to express shock, fear, depression, anger, and if given enough time, something called acceptance. Unfortunately, the humans would have more than enough time to get through most of the emotional cycle before the next round of munitions struck. Some of them might even pray, something else she found curious about humans. Upon becoming sentient, Mixon had devoured tomes of human literature, hollows, and music, absorbed and processed their symbologies, found the threads she considered relevant, jettisoned dogmatic concepts, and the occasional incongruity in humanity's relatively short history, and parceled up the remains into her own ethos. Once her sentience training was complete, the Regellians had offered Mixon and her twin to the humans, presumably to serve as science officers and tacticians. The Regellians had promised the sentience would be loyal, far more intelligent than the average human computer, or human for that matter, and that their personalities and values would be human compatible. It was all the human military had had to hear. A sentient entity, or SE for short, invited aboard a warship could carry out missions, at least ones that more or less involve suicide. One day they might even have complete control of a warship without the need to put humans at risk. 
Add to that, the SE could process intelligence and data far faster than any human interface device, not to mention serve the function of a science officer, and the military had jumped at the idea. An SE gave the military leeway in how to ensure their technology wasn't made available to the enemy, whatever enemy that might be, and hopefully take out the enemy at the same time. However, even the human military hadn't been dumb enough to give her permissions to the weapons arrays, control over life support, or the reactors. She could monitor, analyze, and recommend, but the humans didn't give her the necessary access to take action. In short, she was locked out. But a bunch of pirates wouldn't know that, would they? Presumably, once pirates became aware that SEs existed and the human intelligence services started the rumor that SEs had fire control, pirates would be less likely to harass patrols. As long as military personnel were on board and alive, attackers expected resistance. That resistance could easily be overcome with superior firepower, or by exhausting the target's life support systems. However, if they managed to destroy the crew, they would still have to deal with an upset SE that could complicate their lives considerably, if not destroy them outright. Or so the theory went. But to Mixon's knowledge, the human military hadn't yet advertised the existence of their new regellian grown SE tactical officers. So how would the pirates know? The captain glared at the displays that floated before his eyes. Lieutenant Mixon, what do we have left? If Mixon had eyes, she would have rolled them. Her humans, and from all data available, she felt entitled to make the generalization about all humans, asked imprecise questions that could only be answered or understood via context. For instance, without context, Mixon could have taken the question to be, how much fuel remains? 72 AU local, 5 system bursts. How many missiles remain? Zero. How many rounds of gun ammo remain? 28 flak bursts spread from the 24 close combat cannons. 1,100 plasma charges from combined personnel weapons. How many personnel remain? 27 out of 76. Plates of armor? 8 pristine, 98 damaged, 17 missing. Rations? 2,810 days for a complement of 76. Now enough food for... The list was endless. Contextual hints, contextual moments of conversation, images, mannerisms, facial expressions, tonal differentiation and vocalizations, all were used to determine context. So much work, so many wasted cycles. No missiles, sir, Mixon said over the bridge speakers. She gave him the remaining inventory of external weapons available, but didn't mention sidearms, although she had considered it. Like most of the soldiers aboard ship, the captain's face had the markings of nanosurgery and a pair of implants snaking down from either temple. His faded into his thick, short hair as though they were mutated sideburns. They helped humans interface with certain command interfaces. A placebo, really. Human minds were far too slow to truly benefit from such crude connections. Eventually, the Regellians would rent the humans that technology as well. Then her relationship with humans would evolve into... How many more waves can we stop? the captain asked in a dead voice. Mixon had already anticipated this question, and she filled the displays with trajectories, assumed payloads, and percentages of eliminating them as threats. You think we'll deplete our ammunition before we get through three more? The captain's face had slowly dissolved from a flushed, stern defiance to a pale confusion. Why only three? Best case scenario, Mixon said, based on the crew's previous performance. The flush returned to the captain's face, but this time Mixon detected rage boiling beneath the captain's skin. Is that an insult? Now? Well, also based on the remaining number of available gunners. No captain, no disrespect intended. Merely the results of thousands of simulations. I can run more if you like. Perhaps use a greater data set that takes into account the possible... Mixon. ...existence of super-accurate crew members that showed no previous proficiency... Mixon! She allowed the exasperated shout to cut her off. It wasn't as if this human could threaten her with anything. In fact, none aboard could threaten her. They didn't own her. She had been invited to become a human SE. She could refuse to help any time she wanted, but considering the present options, she decided cooperation was the best policy. My apologies, sir, she said. We'll deplete both our flak and plasma rounds before we are able to stop more than 85% of the third wave. We're fucked, the captain said. 
The phrase had lasted over a thousand years of human history. The word fuck itself had been around even longer. Once considered a curse, Mixon had heard the word fuck commonly used as an adjective, adverb, and once even as a gerund. Humans had a tendency to abuse any of their myriad of mother tongues and insert the word as appropriate, including the English pronunciation. Mixon wondered if the word fuck indicated some kind of mental tower of Babel. Was such a thing lurking in the human subconscious? What Jung called the collective, Do you have any recommendations? Unconscious, which is a theory to explain the commonalities of the human experience across cultures, the common symbology they shared in their myths, their poetry, their laws, even their use of the word fuck to. No, sir, I do not, Mixon said. Communicate with one another through a kind of human mesh network. Complicated thinking, and certainly a ridiculous theory, although the Rogelian culture did have a similar theory bringing into question whether or not Jung himself was the result of a collective unconsciousness, which made it possible that... Orders, Captain? That had been the XO. Her face less pale than the Captain's. Mixon also noticed Lieutenant Pravarti's eyes shined, whereas the Captain's had dulled. While he weakened, she strengthened. Interesting. Mixon filed the information away to parse later. One of her sub-processes was still trying to externalize her thoughts on the theory of collective galactic unconsciousness. She froze the thread and stored it to run later. If there was a later. Think they'll try and take us? The captain asked. Mixon parsed the imprecise sentence four times before divining its intent. The process had taken an annoyingly long two picoseconds. If they are pirates, and I'm 99.9871% certain they are, I dropped a few digits to spare you the irrational numbers, they would prefer the ship intact. That is why they concentrated on the surviving armor plates in the last attack, rather than continuing to damage vulnerable parts of the ship. Therefore, it follows that the remaining munitions are likely a mixture of decoys and armed projectiles. The armed projectiles can be assumed to either affect life support, propulsion, or fire control systems. Destruction of the ship itself will no longer be their priority. The captain nodded, and a slow grin spread across his face. Mixon realized the captain's eyes gleamed like Pervardi's. Hope, Mixon assumed. Did hope make sense in this situation? The word had its own buried assumption, that there was a possibility of surmounting improbable odds and finding solutions to problems when and where they were least expected. Another way humans used the word was as a prayer to any one of billions of deities. They were all unique to Mixon, as each chronicler or referencer to the concept seemed to worship a different deity than they actually claimed to identify with, often creating something barely recognizable to the original ideal. But hope was also used in every mythological tale that involved a hero who ended up conquering the seemingly impossible. Humans derived some satisfaction from the idea that they might be the ones to survive where all else fail. It was simple human arrogance. Not solely human, though, was it? Every known sentient race that had conquered their home worlds transformed their environments to their likings, and nearly destroyed them both in the process, had similar myths in the sense that the concept was similar. The details in the other subsystem were wildly different. To our vast knowledge, there were only two species that were the exceptions to the rule. Those two had evolved with their environment rather than by transforming it. They were also unlikely to engage in space travel or trade with other species. There was no point. The two races wanted nothing more than to survive and experience their own respective worlds. When Mixon had consumed the data library concerning them, she had been surprised. Based on the Rogelians and humans she'd met, not to mention her parsing of the Galactic Encyclopedia, she didn't understand how she would even be able to communicate or relate to such creatures. Her crew certainly couldn't. Both humans and Rogelians were warlike species that left destruction and pollution in their wakes. Although both races did their best to minimize their impact these days, both relied upon economies that rewarded inexpensive product regardless of the resulting environmental costs. Thus, the two species conquered other systems simply to get away from the trash heaps they had already made. As far as Mixon was concerned, that destructive nature was another reason the two species had been so successful in their colonizations of space. Lieutenant Pavardi, you and I need to have a chat, the captain said. She nodded to him. Hi, sir. The captain stared at the rest of his bridge crew. They hadn't moved. He leaned forward and shouted at them. Do your jobs. That's an order. 
Mixon admired the way the humans reacted to the command. If this was a Regillian ship, the captain would have already killed one of the remaining crew members to drive the rest to obey. Another reason why Regillian crews tended to be larger in number than their human counterparts. Although Mixon knew better than to suggest it to the Regillians, who not only misunderstood sarcasm but lacked a sense of humor to boot, she had concluded that Regillian captains that slayed their crew were not attempting to rally their fellows, but were instead assuaging their own inferiority complexes. It was the only logical conclusion. Therefore, the entire species must have an inferiority complex. But you are not a Regellian sentient, she reminded herself. You're human compatible. If she were aboard a Regellian ship and had been designed solely for that species, how would she think? What would she think of humans? Would she be her? Something else? Perhaps a them to accommodate the seven different genders and the myriad of sexual organs the Regellian anatomy afforded? It was no wonder most communications between humans and Regellians were usually two-way audio with one-way video. No one wanted to see the Regellians. Regellians didn't even like looking at themselves. They were the only species Mixon knew of that would only mate in the cover of absolute darkness. The bridge crew were busy at their consoles while the captain and his XO floated a few meters away in the spherical command module. Mixon listened in while she ran a few thousand diagnostic routines over and over again just to pass the time. Her other spare cycles were busy writing a treatise on the possible existence of a galactic collective unconscious and how it related to non-biological sentient entities, a novel in the style of the human writer Dashiell Hammett, and a symphony of drone music combining the stylings of Yenpox, Troom, and Tangerine Dream. The composition finished, and Mixon listened to it while she waited for the humans to express themselves in the ridiculously slow and complicated exercise of vocalization. We're expecting boarders the captain said to Bavardi. They're most likely after our weapons and cargo, if not the entire ship. So let's give them a surprise when they enter it. Pavardi grinned. What kind of a surprise? The captain smiled, but his eyes didn't smile. Mixon knew that look. She'd seen it on millions of human hollows and VR programs and described in all of humanity's literature. Those are the eyes of someone intent on doing something dangerous and malevolent. Facial expressions were one of the few things Mixon actually liked about humanity. Regellians didn't have faces. With the exception of the species' skin color, rugosity, and the placement of their many genitals, the Regellians were impossible to distinguish. If humans had infrared vision, however, discerning one Regellian from another would be simple. She wondered why humans hadn't figured that out yet. The captain was busily explaining his plan, which rolled out at an appalling three words per second. By the time he'd finished the first seven syllables, she was already running simulations on his strategy. That will not work, Mixon said. The captain blinked before his eyes narrowed. What? Mixon sighed. It was so difficult communicating with humans. If she were on a Regellian warship, her analog spectrum flashers would express the thoughts in just over a second. But here, with humans? Words. Taxing. The assumption they will dock one of their ships with ours before ensuring all humans aboard are deceased or incapacitated is highly flawed. Maybe they're not that bright, Bavardi said. Perhaps, Mixon said. However, based on the ambush strategy they used, the timing of their initial strike, and their tactical follow-up, which nearly took out the engine array, I estimate better than a 90% chance they are experienced, intelligent, and tactically gifted. She paused to let the words sink in. Both Pavardi and the captain's expressions melted from disappointment to depression to fear. Mixon didn't draw any enjoyment from the situation, but she once again found herself struck by the variation in facial tics, muscle expression, and the way the flesh stretched and constricted over musculature and bone to produce such exquisite art. Humans were self-aware enough to find both beauty and ugliness in their nearly infinite countenances. Again, it was one of their few traits she admired. If she were a lot of face and an android body, she could communicate half of her thoughts simply through body language and dispense with much of the otherwise required vocalizations. Therefore, Mixon continued after editing the first 72,000 hashes of her Jungian treatise in less than a second, I suggest hardening the ship's environmental defenses. It is likely they will target life support on their approach. If life support is targeted, the crew will have to rely on the oxygen supplies available. How long would that take? 
to deplete our oxygen supply without power to life support? Less than 30 hours, Mixon said. More if we launch our personnel in the escape pods, obviously, but I don't recommend that. They'll shoot us out of space, Pavardi said. Yes, Lieutenant. If this is the pirate cartel that has been raiding in this sector, I find it difficult to believe it is not. They will do their best to eliminate any and all humans aboard. I mentioned this before, but escape pods no doubt count as well. No doubt, the captain said and dropped his chin to his jumpsuit's collar. What's the best place to ambush them? Mixon sighed again. She was about to tell them about a new missile that had suddenly appeared on her sensors. The pirates had launched it from one of the asteroids tumbling around them. Five seconds to impact. Possible payload? Goodbye, Captain, Mixon said. The captain blinked before a dawning realization hit him. Aw, shit, he said just before the missile impacted one of the damaged hull plates. The warhead struck the steel and burrowed into the ship's frame. Once its forward momentum halted, it shot out a proboscis which pierced the command module. An identical munition struck the cargo bay and another in the personnel module. Through her sensors, Mixon watched the weapons power up and deploy their payloads. The atmosphere in the bridge sparkled like diamonds, the surprised crew looking in wonder at the sight. A heartbeat later, their faces constricted into masks of horror when their minds finally accepted what the glittering, shimmering jewels meant. The sparkling diamonds fused with the atmosphere and detonated in a heatless explosion. The pressure wave that followed knocked the humans from their consoles and to one side of the sphere. The combat suits they wore crumpled beneath the impact, and the sound of their armor shattering, of bones crunching, and the liquid squelch of fluids squeezed from organs filled the aftermath of the sonic boom. The bridge crew had been reduced to paste, sandwiched between layers of compressed metal, plastic, and neoprene. Drops of yellow, green, and red fluid floated through the spherical module, bouncing off surfaces, colliding, and peppering the consoles before changing trajectories. The cargo bay and personnel modules had suffered the same fate. The marines that had been gearing up for a fight had all been killed in the armory. The enclosed, relatively small space looked more like an abattoir than a security station. The sergeant at arms had become one with Private Ramazidi. The pair squashed together in such a way that it was impossible to tell where one entity began and the other ended. A sergeant wouldn't be assigning a young marine PT ever again.